Peter. <laughs> hey, Jana. <laughs> Welcome to the Pioneers broadcast. Here we are in this like virtual world. Good to be know, here, virtual time, earth. <laughs> I know last time I welcomed you to Pioneer Works was in person. Yeah, I, I hope that again. It's, soon. it's such a great space. Yeah, thank you so much. We, we're, we'll definitely look forward to having you back soon. I am excited to have you tonight to talk about your new film, Black Holes, The Edge of All We Know. This is your fourth feature, is that it right? It is. Yeah, I started with a film about the moral political arguments about whether scientists should build a hydrogen bomb in the late 40s, yes. mm -hmm. and then one on nuclear secrecy that bleeds over into the question of national security secrecy more generally. The film's called Secrecy. A third one was called Containment, mm -hmm. about the containment of nuclear waste for 10,000 years. Now, you are exceptional in this space of filmmakers because not that many filmmakers also are physicists and also are best-selling authors. <laughs> so you have sort of an unusual nexus of subjects. Do you think that you're bringing all of those things to these films? Because it feels like it. Yeah, you know, I think there's certain themes for me that really saturate all the work that I do. And one of them is the concreteness and the materiality of science, that science takes place with real people in real places with real problems. Mm -hmm. And another is the role of the visual or imaging in, mm -hmm. in science has been immensely important to me. I wrote a book called Image and Logic about two different ways of experimenting, making images or counting and doing statistics. And my work in physics now is with the Event Horizon Telescope. My efforts over the last five, six years have been entirely on trying to make images. And in fact, now even moving images. Now, Event Horizon Telescope, which you just mentioned, is very central to this film. The film is called Black Holes, The Edge of All We Know. It's interesting. It's sort of about black holes, but it's sort of about the campaign, about the human pilgrimage. And, and what drew you to this topic? First, let's start with the black holes. What drew you, drew you to the topic of black holes for a film? Well, I think there are a couple of things. One is after having done these films that have to do with nuclear weapons and national security secrecy and the disposal of waste from nuclear weapons, I really wanted to do something about the side of science that I love. I mean, I think there's a side of science for which everyone working in science feels some responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's dominated what the work I've done in, 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 in filmmaking. But Black holes are a subject that I love. I actually, and <laughs> people that I filmed, including you, are my friends, largely. Mm -hmm. uh, they're people I care about, who work on problems I care about. And I, there's something about black holes that are not like any of the other incredibly fascinating objects of physics. I wrote my PhD dissertation in physics on the Higgs particle. I love the Higgs particle. Mm -hmm. but the Higgs particle is not the subject of science fiction and poetry and everyday <laughs> metaphor. People don't say, oh, you know, he's a he's a Higgs particle. They do say, oh, you know, he's really a black hole. And I think that there is a sense in which black holes cover this range from the most philosophical, abstract, aspirational fears and hopes that we have a kind of sign and symbol of death, all the way down to you know screwing in a in a preamplifier into a radio telescope at fifteen thousand feet, and I thought that combination of really concrete procedures, the difficulty of uh, of of work, mm -hmm. as well as this much more abstract and aspirational side of science, this philosophical side of science. Yeah, and that combination see, really interested me. You, um, it's very clear that these are the two, there are, there are many layers of the film, but there are two groups that you follow predominantly. One led by Shep Dolman, who was the PI of the Event Horizon Telescope, which delivered to us at the end of your film, uh, the image behind you. Yes. <laughs> uh, the first ever human procured image of a black hole. And I don't know if you had this experience, but a lot of people were surprised to know we had never taken a picture of a black hole. <laughs> there was this lore that we knew about black holes and yet we, it had never been done 
before. And um, you were part of this, this team, really. You, you worked with this entire experiment. It's about 200 people on this experiment? Yeah, at the time of the image, it was about 200. And now it's gotten, it's grown over much bigger than that. People have been excited by it. And it's been a great welcoming experience to bring people with different expertise into it. Um, I think that our observations of black holes, whether they were astronomical studies with telescopes at the core of galaxies, or whether they were uh, the great experiments of LIGO, mm -hmm. uh, which were measuring pulsations in space and time, but not visual mm -hmm. images. They were incredibly important in transformational data that helped us understand what these objects were and helped establish the reality of them. I was particularly drawn to the idea of actually making a picture. Mm -hmm. Now, when you started this film, it must have been about four years you were filming. Yeah. Uh, this had not been achieved yet. You're in the room, as you said, very procedural. They're screwing things. The weather is bad. They're about to start observing. The clock is ticking. You know, something's gone wrong at the South Pole. Um, that whole process, you didn't know what the outcome was going to be. I tried to make it the way most science films are made, which is where you know the answer to begin with. You know, the discovery of DNA, the race to plastics, I mean, whatever it is. And then you fill it in by guessing what the different people are going to say who you want to bring into the film. Mm -hmm. And over time, I've wanted more and more to get away from that model, but rather to use film as a kind of inquiry, as a kind of exploration. Now, the downside of that is that you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, that's the upside, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I started filming, it was a guess, really, that the Event Horizon Telescope would not only succeed, but succeed in a time horizon that was you know, the four or five years I, I, I planned on working on this, mm -hmm. and that the collaboration, the other side of the film with Stephen Hawking and his collaborators and, and Andy Strominger and Malcolm Perry, and then young Sasha Hako, who is a graduate student and then uh, finished her, her work, that those are, those were, they had a goal, but mm -hmm. it wasn't sure how what the path would be, what the reversals would be. But I found that incredibly interesting. Yeah. I wanted to show what science, with all of its ups and downs and things that misfire, successes, temporary successes, reversals, how that really felt to be mm -hmm. there in the midst. Yeah, I, I liken that aspect. I felt the same way when I was uh, thinking about LIGO, that it was, uh, like a climbing Mount Everest story, right? It's about the campaign, yes. almost the insanity of the campaign. It's not about just taking nice pictures from the summit, although there is that picture behind you from the summit, which is pretty wonderful. So in parallel to this, what you described as kind of procedural, observational, the nuts and bolts of concrete, you mentioned Andy Strominger and also Malcolm Perry, um, uh, who are doing very theoretical work. It's not just about the Event Horizon Telescope. And I get the title, The Edge of All We Know, because that's really where they're pushing us. They're working on uh, the very basis of reality. They're trying to save reality in some sense from our own paradoxes. Could you talk to us about that, about the paradox Stephen Hawking foisted on us? So back in almost 50 years ago, 1974, Stephen Hawking made it clear that there was a tremendous gap between two things that we thought we knew. One is that all of physics, even quantum mechanics, seems to say if you know the present, you can go backwards and say what happened in the past. I mean, this was a dream that goes back to Laplace who had this imaginary demon, a kind of supercomputer of all la lettre who uh, could, could say everything that had happened and was happening and then it would happen in the future. So the, the, the equations of physics tell us that you can go backwards or forwards from the present. Now that doesn't mean in real life you could take the ashes of a burnt book and reconstruct it completely. But if you made a movie of it and you played the movie backwards, you get a kind of idea of what it would be to imagine the reconstruction of that book. And in 
the equations of physics say it could be done even if in real life it's impossible. So then on the other side, you have black holes. And black holes have something that John Wheeler put very briefly and the idea that they have no hair. That if you have two black holes of the same mass and they're spinning at the same, in the same way, there's nothing different about them, nothing. And so a black hole, this featureless object in space, aside from its mass and its spin, has eliminated how it got in, came into existence. Everything that fell into it, a star, a giraffe, a typewriter, a piano, doesn't matter. They're all the same. Any, any two black holes that have the same mass and spin are identical. So if you look up at the sky and you see these holes in space and time, they are exceptions to the rule for all of physics. Mm -hmm. If you know where all the black holes are, you still can't go backwards and say how they were made. So there's this clash between the ancient goal of physics, which is to be able to predict and retrodict to say about the past based on the present and these black holes. Yeah. And that contradiction or paradox is what Hawking at the end of his life and Andy, Malcolm and Sasha were trying to do. They were trying to make the world safe again for physics. That's right. Uh, the, what's fascinating about what you're describing is to some extent, black holes are like the Higgs particle in the way that you've just described. They're almost like fundamental objects, not like astrophysical objects at all. They're like fundamental particles. They're just big. They only have certain numbers that describe them. That's how we think about particles, not how we think about real objects that are macroscopic. So the black hole is like this boundary between fundamental microscopic physics and macroscopic physics. And it's exactly that boundary that as you're describing, Hawking was challenging and you're in this film guiding people between that kind of fundamental thinking about what are black holes telling us about the laws of reality, um, the future and the past. And yet, despite what I'm saying, they are astrophysical objects, right? They are dead states of stars. And it's, it's exactly really... that divide that you're navigating in this film. That's like, wait, what are these things? It's nothing else in the universe that I can think of that is even remotely like that. Um, Nothing like that. And I think you're exactly right. They are very big elementary particles, not only in, in um, the, the end, you know, people talk about the life cycle of stars or astronomers talk about the, you know, their stars are born and they mature and then they begin to die. They run out of fuel, they can collapse and the end state of it all can be under the right circumstances a black hole. Mm -hmm. But there are also these things, these monsters like this one in the picture, which is it, a six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. If its center was located on our sun, its event horizon would be out past Pluto. I mean, these, this is a big elementary particle. And, yeah. uh, and so the idea of these things floating around in the world is really it's kind of terrifying in a way. I mean, not because I think there's any big risk we're gonna fall into one, but because they represent this end of things. And the title Edge, Edge of All We Know refers both to the kind of frontier of our knowledge in which we are as, as your center pioneer works mm -hmm. indicates in its name. It's, it, it is a kind of edge of what we, of what we, can, we, we have understood to date, mm -hmm. but it's also the edge of the black hole, the horizon, which is in a way what makes a black hole a black hole. It's mm -hmm. the fact that you have this edge and anything can pass through it going in, mm -hmm. but nothing can come out. And if the project, the late project of Hawking and collaborators was to work, it had to be by storing information about what had happened to make the black hole on the horizon. And the Event Horizon Telescope, as its name suggests, is about getting in as close as we can to the horizon, to look at the swirling 10 billion degree hot gas that's going around the black hole. And we see that as it's as close as it can get and still be visible to us 
mm -hmm. uh, as seen from 55 and a half million light years away. What intrigues me about the picture is that you couldn't see the black hole if it was right next door to us unless it's illuminated. It really is literally a shadow. What you have behind you is a, is a shadow cast by this bright debris that you're describing. Um, and, uh, and as you said, that's a pretty big shadow by our standards. It goes out to Pluto if it were centered on the sun. But, um, but for the size of the thing, six and a half billion times the mass of the sun, it isn't six and a half billion times the size of the sun. It's much, 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 much smaller than that. So even though it's big by our solar system standards, they're spatially small. I think that's one of the things people forget. Black holes are spatially small. And uh, if you can describe to us why that was such a challenge for the Event Horizon Telescope, that they're small, actually. Heavy, that guy, but spatially tiny. That's true. Uh, if you could imagine um, holding your arm out and looking at an atom, that's how hard it is to see. Or saying, sitting in New York and reading the date off a penny uh, in California or Paris, that's how hard it is to pick out the black hole 55 million light years away. It's big, the size of the solar system by our puny standards, but if you put it that far away, it cuts out an angle on the sky that is staggeringly small. This is the most precise, highest resolving telescope that's ever been made. And it's not a single telescope, of course. It is not a single telescope. What you need is a telescope the size of the Earth. You need to have, it's like having a, a, an optical telescope. The bigger you get it, the more light you can get and the bigger you can blow up the image that you're looking at. And you can calculate what would it take to read the date off a penny in California looking at it from New York. Mm -hmm. And you need this incredible, extraordinary ability to resolve things far away. And so you can't build a telescope the size of the earth. So you do the next best thing. You use the greatest telescopes, radio telescopes that exist all over the earth and you link them up to make a kind of virtual telescope, as if you had shards of a mirror making a giant optical telescope the size of the Earth. And you link them up in such a way and with such precision that you can coordinate the, lights, the light falling on each of these telescopes and reconstruct them in a supercomputer to make the image. Now, there's two things that happen for, for me in the film is that description of the collaboration is really beautiful um, and how, hard they are on themselves. They analyze the data in four separate groups, even though they're in the same collaboration, they don't speak to each other. You know, they really hold themselves to task. And I, I thought that was very beautiful and very moving. And then they succeed, right? <laughs> they succeed. So you saw this, you were one of the first people on the planet to have seen this image. Um, I was also there, I saw you at the press uh, announcement at the National Press Club in DC. We were both there um, and I had not seen it. And I remember the big surprise being that it was M87, which is a galaxy, as you said, 55 million light years away. And it's a enormous black hole in another galaxy. I always thought our target was still gonna be Sagittarius A star, which is a black hole in our own galaxy. So we have a black hole that we orbit. You know, I, tell, I try to tell people we are in orbit around a black hole. That's part of our shapes, our fist, our past and our future. Um, but we didn't get capture uh, Sagittarius A star. Do you think that we will one day? Do you think that there will be another big announcement? Our own black hole has been revealed. Um, so or can you not say? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I can say. Uh, first, you know, there, there is a black hole at the cent it seems at the center of every galaxy and or every non bizarro galaxy. Mm -hmm. And the one that's much nearer to us is much smaller, but it's like looking at the moon and the sun to our great pleasure, those of us who like seeing eclipses, the moon and the sun appear the same size on the sky, but the moon is much smaller than the sun. And mm -hmm. the one, the black, the supermassive black hole that's at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 1,500 times smaller than the one that's M87, but it's 1,500 times closer. It's only 25,000 light years away from us, as opposed to 
um, 55 million light years away. So mm -hmm. it is the, the, the virtual telescope that the Event Horizon Telescope has made is exactly the right configuration to look at Sagittarius A star, our very own supermassive black hole. So mm -hmm. we're working on that now. And um, it's the, 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 the great hope is that we can do it. It's, it is closer. It's smaller, so things change much faster. If it takes a you know a day in the life of M87 is like a minute in the life right. of Sagittarius A star. Mm -hmm. So we also have to look at what's changing over time, it, mm -hmm. and then it's in, because our Milky Way is like a plate, and the black hole's at the middle, and we're sort of halfway out to the exterior ridden of the black hole of the of the galaxy all the light from it has to go through a lot of junk so there's scattering to worry about it's it's a hard problem but it's we have a great opportunity because it's closer because it changes quickly because we know the nobel prize was just a given for this work we know there's stars orbiting close to it in like 15 year orbits that may seem slow but to an astronomer to be able to pull a star around at a speed faster than some planets go around the our own sun, that's amazing. That's yeah. the sign of a very powerful force. So in this other thread, this much more theoretical abstract pursuit with Hawking and Perry and Strominger, um, and I forgot the young woman's Sasha name. Sasha Heiko. Heiko, yeah. um, who's very compelling in your film as well. Um, I know the others personally, so I'm not like, only forgetting the junior person's name. <laughs> um, so they have less clear success, but they have the same collaborative spirit, right? They're, they're arguing with each other. They need each other. They need the contrasting point of views. They're never rejecting a challenge to their ideas because it'd be terribly unscientific. Hawking comes in and it, it he, he, clearly had long delays in his communication. So he only said something essential and, and he couldn't elaborate on what he would say. He would say one line, how many conformal killing vectors on the, are there on the horizon? And, they, and the rest of the collaborators freeze. And they realize they hadn't, maybe they hadn't thought about it that much. And then they're trying to interpret what he means. It's actually this, this beautiful demonstration of collaboration and also that at the end, they have this reveal of this great paper, but which is a beautiful paper, but not as much clarity on success of discovery. Yeah, I, I, I really am glad you brought this up because I think that the collaborative aspect of science is one of the things that we least discuss in, in the culture, in society, and even as scientists talking to the world, you know, there, we have the idea of a race between two people. We have the idea of success and failure and things like the Nobel Prize tend to focus on individuals who have contributed something. Right. And it tends to ignore the idea of these collaborations, which is really essential to the idea of science. And I thought in the observational side, you can see that very plainly. And I think, you know, once you begin to think about it, you know, Shep Dolman, for instance, can repair a piece of equipment at 15,000 feet where there's half as much oxygen and everybody's sort of turning a shade of green and you can't think straight. You know, you're not, if you're, a, I used to pilot small planes, you're not, you can't fly at 15,000 feet without supplemental oxygen. And here we are trying to repair things and make things work. Um, and then there are other people who are computer gurus. There are people who are data analysts, uh, a young Katie Bowman in the film, who's, uh, who did terrific work and with whom I continue to, to collaborate mm -hmm. these days is, you know, came out of computer vision. And all of these expertise, theorists of different stripes, um, people, data analysts, all these people had to work together to make it work. Mm -hmm. But even then, and I think as you rightly point out in what you just said, theory, you might think, well, theory is just theory. I mean, it's just an equation, but there are really different personalities or minds in theory. And I wanted that to come out clearly. And they are very aware of that. I mean, Andy knows that he likes to jump on a solution and run with it. And Malcolm is 
is super methodical. And yeah. at one point, Andy says in the film to uh, to, to Malcolm, well, Malcolm, we have a thousand terms in this expression. Even you couldn't do all that by hand without a computer. And Malcolm sort of says, yeah, maybe I could do 500. And he's not exaggerating. He no, could he's... do 500. Um, and and Stephen Hawking has an entirely different, you know, because it's, just as you said, he, you know, the number of words has to be, you know, he had to compose them mm. very slowly. So every word had to count. And often they would come in the form of a question. And just in virtue of asking the question, he would propel the collaboration forward. Yeah. What yeah. they were trying to do more specifically, but briefly, is they were trying to show that the horizon of a black hole could capture enough information to record everything that fell into it. And that, that this became, there was a quantity, doesn't matter what it means exactly for this, called the central charge that had to be equal to 12 times the angular momentum, 12J. And I use 12J like a, a kind, you know, the, like the Maltese Falcon. It was the object, I thought of it like the Maltese Falcon and uh -huh. uh, that it was the hunt for 12J and they had 12J and they lost right. it and then they got infinity and then they got zero and then they got some 24J and they, and but finally when they got 12, so that became a kind of shorthand. It became a, a sign and symbol of where they were in the hunt. Right, right. and. Um really trying to prove that black holes are a kind of limit to the information that can be contained in anything. And yeah, I mean, the, the weird, black holes are unbelievably paradoxical. They're the they darkest really object in the sky and they're also the brightest beacons in the sky. We know the, dis the farthest reaches of the universe that we can see are because there happens to be a black hole that swirls around gas, hot gas, luminous gas, and shoots it at us. Yes. So, you know, it, and then they're the simplest objects in the world. You know, what can you say about a black hole? It's spin, it's mass, end of discussion. Mm -hmm. And yet they seem to be the greatest hard drive ever created. They right. are the place where you can <laughs> store information. You can... I mean, in a way, a black hole stores all, all of the light that has ever fallen on it. It makes a kind of record. It's like the, the library at Alexandria for the history of the universe. It, is a, it contains the record of everything. Anything the black hole can see is recorded there. So I think one of the beautiful aspects of the film is you can end on a big success and also end on a suspenseful moment because it's an unsolved problem for 50 years since Hawking kind of taunted people with his paradoxes. Um, it's ongoing, but as Strominger says, he believes that it's conceivable in his lifetime that this it, is a know, problem. I think you have to think of it like a cathedral. I mean, Einstein's theory is 1915, 1916 of, the, of general relativity. And then his friend Schwarzschild, who is mm -hmm. fighting on the front uh, in World War I, he's mm -hmm. old, too old to be drafted. He volunteers to go. He's calculating ballistic trajectories in, in this horrible firefight. People around him are dying. And he solves Einstein's equations and creates the, the infrastructure, the intellectual infrastructure for black holes. Mm -hmm. It's 100 years later, yeah. 101 years later, yeah. that we get this image. And if you think about that, the scale of under our understanding of black holes has continued to advance with each generation, yeah. but it's a slow process. It's like building Notre Dame. You know, it's not something that at one generation can say, we built this. So I'm gonna ask you some top fives. Um, I hope I have the right top fives. Okay, what is your top five? Uh, what is not your top five? What is your top sci-fi film? You know, my favorite sci-fi film, and there are several that I really love, uh, is still Tarkovsky's Stalker. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it does such a great job of being psychological and um, social and imaginative and something about science, but it's, it inhabits us. And it becomes more, as, as great science fiction always does, is it's, 
it's not relegated to some little thing about science. It's really about our condition. People are struggling in this kind of forbidden zone to get to the center of it all, to, their, to the realization of their desires. And it becomes a model for how people understand the forbidden zone at Chernobyl, which happens afterwards. And so it's, it's prescient, mm-hmm. it's psychological, it's about the human condition. I think it's a great film. Oh, I'm going to go watch it. I can't believe I've never seen it. You got to see so it. I'm, I'm basically doing this, Peter, so I can get recommendations. Okay. <laughs> this is like what this is. Okay. okay. In the spirit of recommendations, what is your top black hole book that you would recommend or read or loved? Well, you know, there are, there are a couple of them. I love uh, Kip Thorne's book, uh, Black Holes and Time Warps. Mm-hmm. It's I mean, for you as a physicist, you'll you'll know he was part of an effort to make this gigantic textbook, which is everybody has used, Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler. And it's a little bit like that. It's episodic. It's very personal in a way. It's about his relationship to the people who did things. Yeah. It takes time to work out ideas. I think it's 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 a it's not a simple read, but I think it's the most expansive. It's a it's a kind of Tolstoy like vision of black holes um i recommend that book actually even for serious students of physics because it really is kind of for serious students of physics in a way even though it's not technical um he really goes into really goes into it Um, yeah good okay so uh i think i'm gonna change this order what is your favorite sci-fi novel and it doesn't actually have to be sci-fi Science influence novel. And again, this is recommendations. So, so I can go read more books. I, if you haven't, you got to read Joe Haldeman's book, Forever War. It's the first of a trilogy. And it's it's about these two soldiers, a man and a woman who are fighting a battle and they're constantly reassigned. They fall through black hole, you know, time, warps in space and time and end up in the far farther and farther future, but they're always fighting. And I find it incredibly moving and disturbing. I mean, they're fighting, not each become a couple, but they, um, they're fighting um, these battles. And as you read it, you realize that this is also about Vietnam where Haldeman fought as a soldier. Mm-hmm. It's an anti-war book. And it's it's the, the forever war is the war without purpose and milestones, a war where nothing's gained and we're constantly propelled to reassign the idea of who the enemy is or what they are. And and I think that it's 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 a it's science fiction, but it's an also a, I think a profoundly interesting reflection on war in the post-war epoch, the war that we seem to keep fighting, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam or Korea and so on. One of the aspects of science that drew me in was precisely that it transcends human boundaries, cultures, times. It's true in another galaxy. It'll be true in a million years here on Earth. Um, it's true for Chandrasekhar. It was true for Newton. You know, these sort of beautiful transcendences. And so in some sense, science doesn't care about people. And yet in this other sense, as you're describing with something like this sci-fi book, it's a metaphor, right? For how we it live. is. And and science in you know, science is constantly mutating our vision of the world. Mm-hmm. And has, I mean, Newton's ideas show up through Locke in the founding documents of the United States. Mm-hmm. I mean, this idea of natural law yeah, that's there. I, I mean Science is not some separate entity. It's shaped by our world and it shapes our world. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, the thing that most interests me as I as I mentioned at the beginning of the hour was that that science has this dual aspect, that it's both incredibly practical, ferociously consequential in our world, but also our most abstract way of encountering our human condition. And I think that good science fiction, whether and Tarkovsky or um, the Forever War, or other many other books, ha- have that quality of combining something specific and something transcend- transcendental. Mm-hmm. Now for our next, and I think we're on four, 
Tell me about your favorite observatory. And this, I believe, relates even to what you were just saying. There's this abstract pursuit, and then we build something, and we actually try to make it small and real and, you know, in our lifetimes and in our hands and eyes. I love seeing the observatory in Mexico, the large millimeter telescope um, that um, is on top of a defunct volcano uh, called Sierra Negra and right next to the another one that's the tallest mountain in, in, in Mexico. And on top of it, and that's what we see in the film in the opening part of the film, uh, you're 15,000 feet up into the atmosphere. Uh, it's hard to, you know, you think everything's going well and then you climb three steps and you're out of breath. Uh, but it's also, for me, it was completely eye-opening being there that, you know, I'm used to places like CERN and Fermilab and SLAC and the Deutsches Elektronens and Coton. And, you know, where they're highly regimented and, you know, they're safety officers and radiation protection and you can't, it doesn't matter what science you're working on, you can't go in certain areas at certain times and you, you shouldn't be able to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the staff at, at, at some of these radio telescopes is minimal. And, you know, the head of the telescope said, hey, you want to climb on the radio telescope at yeah. night? And I said, sure. So I climb up there and climbing, clamoring around on this gigantic 50 meter wide, you know, uh, structure and looking up at the stars, completely black sky with these pinpoints of bright light. I mean, I, I found it one of the most moving um, sites I've ever been in related to science. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to keep going on that, but I think here we are at our last of our top five. What is your favorite black hole fact? Well, I, I am still amazed that, you know, you look out at the sky, there may be in the visible universe, 100 billion galaxies, and that every one of them has a supermassive black hole at its center. And that those supermassive black holes are sort of silent dead objects, but they're shaping where stars can form by these jets that they spew out. They have reshaped our galaxy. And yet we're just learning about them now. And I feel like saying, you know, how is it that we only know about these things now? These are fundamental objects in the universe around us. It still amazes and, and delights me to think that there are 100 billion supermassive black holes. We've seen at the level of this picture, one. Soon I hope we'll have two. There are 100 billion more to go. Right. <laughs> and of course they were not formed by dead stars, so. no. Where this is a whole other game. Like I try to tell people, dead killing off a few stars is just one way to make a black hole. Maybe the universe has thought of other ways to make black holes, and supermassive black holes seem to be proof that the universe has thought of other ways. And there are other ways, and we don't know what combination. We know that black holes merge together and can get bigger. That's demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Whether some of these very largest black holes are the result of merger of smaller but still big ones, or whether there's dust and stars, or you know who knows. If you think about the fact that some big percentage, between ten and twenty percent of stars have planets, there are probably a lot of planets already been eaten by these by these black holes. There, there. there I think that one of the things when you first see, maybe you had this reaction too when you first see this image of a black hole here, you think. That's a terrifying object. That's a monster. <laughs> and on that wonderful note, I'm so excited to invite everyone to our exclusive screening of your film, which is a wonderful film. I found it very moving. I know I'm very close to the subject. I think people uh, will, will find a lot in it about the human, um, the human desire to know. I, so I hope people watching this can join uh, for the this, this screening at, at Pioneer Works. It'd be, I'm excited for people to, to have a chance to see it. And if for some reason you can't, you can see it at blackholefilm.com. Awesome. And um, congratulations, Peter, on yet another wonderful film. I miss you. I'll see you soon. I hope so, Jana. And thank you for inviting me to your show. Absolutely.